Tim Kong is playing favourites today. He's a primary school teacher. Uh, a job he came to perhaps later than most, having first had a career as a video roadie for acts including Underworld, who did the soundtrack for Danny Boyle's extraordinary Olympic opening ceremony. Tim Kong joins me now. Hello. Good morning. You would have watched that opening ceremony with particular interest then, did you? Yes. No, it was, uh, it was enjoyable to watch. Some of it was a little confusing. Um, but the, yeah, the music was... What were was you confused lovely. about? Oh, the, the, the dancing babies and the big NHS scene seemed a bit... Very Danny Boyle. That's but, Danny um... Boyle for you, isn't it? <laughs> hey? What about train spotting? You know, could have gone either way, really, could have gone for a moment way. Yes, there. no. <laughs> um, how did you get involved with Underworld, for example? Underworld? What's um, your backstory? What's well, my backstory to getting there? Well, my backstory to getting there is probably similar to a lot of Kiwis um, taking a backpack and uh, heading off to the UK and uh, uh, finding myself in some amazing opportunities. Um, my... Uh, before I left there, I was working in, in, in Auckland doing corporate audio visual uh, and when I is being, that for sort of in-house uh, it was for in-house but it was in for hotels it was for conferences it was for car launches and things like that right. uh, and being New Zealand um, and being the market it is you kind of had to learn a bit of sound and a bit of lighting and a, a bit of video this was sort of 97 98 so video was you know big projection was starting to come into into so into that play. would have been a good place to learn learn a lot um, yeah and I think probably the biggest thing you, you kind of learn is, is how to look after clients um, and how to massage that, you know, connection between what a client wants and what the technology can do, and how to make it work within the timeframes. Um, when I got to the UK, uh, just backpacking, uh, I'd sort of run out of money, and a friend I was dossing with there, um, Clark Anderson, uh, said, "Well, you can come up, and uh, you know, I've got some work with a company doing mainly video, and, and you can specialise very quickly." So within a couple of weeks, I was setting up TVs and basic jobs, and um, Setting up TVs? Yes, in hotels for, you know, conferences and things like this. Right. So quite basic stuff, but, you know, get your feet under the table and get to know people. Um, and about three weeks in, um, they said, look, we've got a band going out called the Lighthouse Family. Do you want to come up and learn these projectors? And I said, well, I don't know how to use them, but let's learn them. And, uh, and it sort of went from there. Um, and who are the Lighthouse Family? The, <laughs> the Lighthouse Family. Uh, uh, two gentlemen from, from Newcastle, uh, Tunde and I... Never remember the other gentleman, um, sort of soul singers. They had a couple of, maybe two albums of great uh, radio play and renown in the late 90s. Um, and they were just using video in their show. And so I was responsible for just setting up the projectors and pointing them in the right direction. And um, yeah, it was a, a great learning curve, three three weeks. Um, and first time on a tour bus and first time learning what rock and roll was um, and is. Um, this is this is kind of a relatively new thing that video became part and parcel of live gigs, was it? Um, well, not so much now. I mean, now it's almost expected in every gig. Um, this we was got the late... Tunde Bayewu. That's the one. And Paul Tucker. And Paul Tucker. That's yes. the one. Yep. Um, they're. Uh, I don't know what they're doing now. To be fair, they had a greatest hits album and then probably disappeared. They made a comeback in 2011. Oh, did they? Um, but uh, I don't know what came of it myself. Anyway. So I got, yeah, I got to um, Underworld. My first ever gig with them was Ali Pally, uh, New Year's Eve 1999. Uh, and it was a joint gig, I think, with the Chemical Brothers and um, sort of a couple of the big name DJs. Um, but again, I was just setting up projectors for them. Uh, and it went really So setting well. up projectors is, you know, heavy lifting stuff. Yep. Putting right. them in place, getting them in place, lined up. Pointing the right way, all the cables connected. Yep. Um, important job. Important job. Yes. Yeah. You got to make it make it work. Um, the uh, the first time I ever met Carl, actually from Underworld, I was, it was actually very late at well, sort of two or three in the morning, and I was kind of dozing off at the back, and he came leaping round and shook me and shouted Happy New Year at me. So was he drunk? He wasn't. No, no. He. Uh, I not, asked that advisedly because I gather that he often was. Uh, before I joined them. Yes, he had some issues. But he sorted uh, it out. He had sorted out, and he was, uh, yeah, very much a, a man of the world, but yeah. very much in control of what he was doing. I figured that he must have sorted himself out because mm. they'd been very busy, and you couldn't do that opening ceremony at the Olympics if you were cut. Oh no, I, I believe he stopped uh, drinking way back in sort of ninety eight, ninety seven. Good man. So a long time ago. Yeah. Good man. Um, all right. So you were with the Lighthouse family, and then you got the contact with Underworld. Yep. 
what seamlessly or did what were you doing uh, well i was basically freelance so basically i would go wherever uh, they would their record companies or whoever was organizing their tours would would call up um a company and, and order projectors uh, and video equipment and i would basically come along with it um and that was how i got into most of my jobs you know doing some of them two or three day jobs some of them two or three weeks um underworld were were generous enough to to call me i did three weeks with them in sort of early january uh, and they were generous enough to call me uh probably it would have been sort of march i think and they said well we're off to the U u.s next week we'd like you to come and do the video for us um and that was quite a shift because i went from just setting up projectors to actually now organizing equipment to actually mixing the live show uh, so what were you doing when they called you i mean you didn't have anything that you didn't, you know, have a hair appointment or anything that day. No, I did. <laughs> where my chat with Mark comes in, I, um, I, I had actually just moved to Brighton the night before, and uh, was actually just recovering from from a few beers when they called me up, totally out of the blue, and said, uh, "This was a Tuesday," uh, and they said, "We're off to the US on Saturday. We'd like you to come with us." Uh, and again, this was, you know, I I just moved to Brighton. Um, still living out of my backpack, still backpacking as Kiwis do, uh, and to go from um, doing jobs and doing work to now suddenly being part of a, a, a band and, and what they were doing uh, and touring the US was was fantastic and a lot of fun. Um, we'll talk about that tour in a moment. Let us first of all hear a bit of Underworld. This is from, must have been around that time. Yes, um, this is from Boku the Fish. Boku Fish, the album I toured with, yeah. And on it I you can hear a sample of Cajun, a Cajun fisherman. That's right, oh, right. yep. Um, and uh, this was, I don't know what this was. I, um, belie I believe that sample's taken, um, and Rick will probably follow me up online somewhere, but I believe it's just taken from some friends of theirs recording, just fishing. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you didn't get royalties or anything that Cajun fisherman? Uh, I don't know. I don't <laughs> it's the thing so. with sampling, isn't it? You know, it's <laughs> such a, a mashup. You don't know who's what, what where. Yep. Let's have a listen to Underworld. Jumbo is the track from the 1998 album Boku Fish. Tim, when that was playing at a show, you'd be down there doing the video jock business. That's right, yep. And so tell me how it would work. Um, so when, when I was touring with them, uh, our, we had um, big screens up uh, behind the band, uh, and I would be mixing um, back then. It was actually just off VHS machines. Uh, so we had a big suitcase full of videotapes of different images made by um, uh, their, they were Underworld, Rick and Carl were part of a uh, design collective called Tomato. Uh, so they would uh, supply a lot, a lot of the visuals. Uh, and I would basically mix that. So I'd have three VHSs and, and a monitor and, uh, and then basically be listening and following the music and working with the lighting guy and basically just uh, trying to mix visuals onto the, onto the stage that would suit the music and, and, and increase the vibe. And, and so is it high adrenaline? Or is it a more relaxed kind of vibe? Um, what I loved about Underworld is that every vibe was different, uh, and they were very much about making each show and creating a show that um, met the needs. I mean, we've done you know I've done shows on stage with Glastonbury f with them, and of course it's you know Glastonbury fifty thousand people and pyramid stage, and you're just going for it. Um, I've also done stage uh, shows in basketball courts in in Scandinavia where. You know, only three or four people, hundred, three or four hundred people turn up, and so the vibe's quite a bit flatter, uh, and so it becomes a little more experimental. Um, but and you, sometimes the music will follow your images, or and vice versa. Yeah, sometimes. I mean, we when I was touring, uh, Rick uh, asked for a monitor on the stage so he could see just next to his mixing desk, so he could see what was on the screens behind him. And there were some nice pieces where he would come up after and say, "Well, I'd never seen that visual before. I'd never seen it put in that way." Um, and we were starting then to sort of integrate cameras into the show. So we had a little uh, one of the crew with a live camera that we would feed in, uh, and that would sort of loop. And you'd see, you know, you'd be taking photos of the stage and then showing the audience and things like that. So it was quite, um, you know, experimental in the sense we were just trying to see what would happen. But it was all about creating creating that atmosphere and that sort of that ambience. Jazz, a little <laughs> mentality, a little bit, yeah, a little bit of the jazz. I mean, there was bits where I would. Um, you know, with the lighting guy, I'd, I'd say, well, I'm going to take the video out and just leave it with the lights. Um, occasionally, I would just sort of turn to someone in the audience to start the show and say, look, choose a tape, uh, and we'll see what happens with that visual, and that'll be the intro piece, and then we'll build what happens. I mean, we had set pieces, so for certain songs, you would make sure certain visuals went in, but, um, yeah, it was very much a mix. Actually, talking about the Olympics, um, the Chemical Brothers, whom you also worked with, as you've said, um, wrote a theme for velodrome which was a three-minute song meant to soundtrack the Olympics 
cycling events. Yes, I saw that. Yeah, um, Ed actually tweeted that the other day. I think it's from Galvanise, which is one of their more recent. Was it the Galvanise track? Or well, I don't know. They wrote it specially anyway. Yeah, I yeah. think. So there's some nice. Yeah, yeah. That's it seems nice. is this an unusual thing, you know, to have, you know, hot bands soundtracking the Olympics? Is it um, a Brit pop thing? Possibly a bit. Possibly a bit Brit pop. I'm not sure. I mean, it's very much a lot of those pieces would suit, you know, sort of the the the, the build of of what's going on and, and amping people up to get certain things done. I mean, that's very much what you do in the in the dance you're, or in the clubs you're going for it. Um, as touring has become more and more common and more and more financially necessary for a lot of bands, the sort of job that you do will presumably become more and more in demand. Um, no? Yeah, can do, can do. I think one of the things is technology has possibly made it easier to do in some ways. Oh, right. I know video, for example, is is in some instances been done more because it's a lot more done in software now uh, and can be synced with the audio. So you don't actually have by... to pull the VHSs out of a bag? No, the it's all on, on a couple of hard drives sitting under the desk uh... um, and it can be, you know, managed by the maybe the lighting designer or someone else. Uh, I mean, when you've got camera crews involved in sort of big shows and, and you know, obviously things like The Stones and U2 where you've got big... Uh, cameras are a major part of it, then you've got a whole, obviously you need people to drive cameras. Um, but saying that, there's plenty of sets where they're putting either remote cameras or fixed cameras. And so you basically have a television studio that's running the show at the same time. So what was that tour of the United States with Underworld like? Uh, that, that, my first one on the road with them. Uh, that was pretty intense. I think by memory we did about uh, 12 gigs in 14 days. Uh, so it was... That's a lot, isn't it? It was, yep, yep. Um, and so, was, and a lot of travelling in between times, or were you mostly in one? Area? No, no. It was. Uh, I joined them in New York, and they'd done Washington D.C. the night before. So it was D.C., New York, Philadelphia, uh, Montreal, Toronto. Then a day to drive to Chicago, uh, and a, sh a show in Chicago. So all on a bus that loop, uh, and then we flew to Seattle, and then it was Seattle, uh, San Francisco, um, Las Vegas, and Los Angeles in about five days. Um, we we did all of them. I did uh, did video at all of them, um, and some of it was very. Uh, I think in in Seattle we were packing in, and I was actually calling ahead to San Francisco to try and find a video company to supply equipment because we weren't actually travelling with a lot of our video equipment because it was such a rushed uh, tour to start. Oh so, really? Yeah. Why so it was, was it such a rush? Um, I think in part initially I was called on just to do two shows, uh, to do New York and, and Los Angeles, and um, then in that week before, sort of in the two or three days after it. Uh, Rick called me up. Um, it, it changed to right. Let's just keep you on, and we'll take the stuff with us, and we'll make it happen, and we'll add the video into it. Um, Las Vegas was the only one that sort of we didn't weren't able to do it. We were playing the the House of Blues, and I think from memory, we were as the as the in house tech said, "You guys are the dance guys after Crash Test Dummies." Um, so it was this, and we were inside the House of Blues, which is actually inside the casino. So there was this amazing scene. We weren't actually able to set up our video, so it was just the guys were just going to do the performance. Um, but we walked down through the casino to come to the gig, and around one side of the wall was all these uh, sort of rave kids with, you know, fluoro hair and funky space age clothes and the whole thing lining up to come in. And coming out the other way from Crash Test Dummies were the, <laughs> the blue jeans, cowboy boots, and cowboy hats in the middle of you know all the pokey machines and the, all the slot machines in the casino. So it was very mm. much a, a weird clash of <laughs> what Vegas is. <laughs> nice to have your audience defined in such yeah, a fashion, though. Yeah. Um, you ended up doing um, some work with Nine Inch Nails. I did, um, yes. Which you quit. <laughs> Why? Uh, walked away from. Yeah, uh, it was late 99. Um, I uh, had just finished uh, uh, another round with Underworld through the US and uh, stayed on in LA for, with, for a few days with a friend. Uh, and some work came up as it freelance does, and they said, well, We'll fly to New Orleans for rehearsals with this Nine Inch Nails and um, see what happens, really. And at that time, there wasn't any. We weren't sure what was going to happen with the tour, but it was potentially it could have been a you know a year long tour, and and you know you get in at the ground floor. So um, flew to New New Orleans for a week, uh, set up all the projectors. Um, we didn't actually have any footage at the time. Uh, David Carson was doing the the visuals, if I remember rightly. So he was producing them somewhere else. Uh, so I basically spent the week in New Orleans um, not allowed to go into the theatre until after midnight because Trent was rehearsing with the band and we weren't allowed to come in until after midnight to, 
to do the video and lighting. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd spent the day just sort of wandering New Orleans and exploring and uh, and then come in. And each day, I'd, each night I'd come in and say, are the visuals here? And they'd say no. So I'd say, oh, okay. So I'll sit around for half an hour or so. Um, things went a little bit crazy. It's sort of towards the end of the week, David Carson's visuals arrived and uh, Trent didn't like them. So it was all hands on deck to try and make things happen. Um, I flew back to London. Not I sure. mean, Trent's the boss, right? Yeah. He founded them yep. and he's in charge of everything. Yeah, he's very much. Is he control freak? Um, I'm sure you could say that. I'm only, I only met him once or twice. And so I mean, he's the producer and he's the singer and he's the yep. songwriter and he's the blah, blah, blah. I, I, would, I would, you know, as with any strong artist, he knows what he wants and he knows what he wants to do it. And he's done some amazing, some amazing work. Um, the, the, I flew back to London and we kind of got involved really quickly. Rehearsals got set up and it went from me just being there as a projectionist to... Uh, can you source us visuals? I was getting calls from the States. Um, can you source us an editing suite to edit an NTSC? Uh, can you provide? So I was sort of black cabbing it all over London to try and find these things. Again, out of my own pocket. Um, Why out of your own pocket? <laughs> at the time, um, it was very much just needs to get done. And at the time, they were calling me directly. So it was, all right, well, you know, as a freelance guy, this will just be part of the show. And I was there was supported. never a moment where you were able to say, excuse me, but are you going to pay me? Uh, <laughs> There was there was a moment where, and this was the bit where the alarm bells finally started Bad form, ringing. is it? <laughs> no, no. Well, it was there was the moment where um, I I'd, I'd got the editing suite all set up for them, and this was London in late '99, and you know editing time and, and is you know paid by the day, and it can be quite expensive. And I went to head out to head back to the rehearsing space where we were, had the projectors and everything, and um, the 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 person there said, well, you know, Tim, someone needs to pay. They're not, a, they're not on our account, so it's, it's one day so needs to pay. I said, well, Trent's in there with his accountant and, and all those people, so, you know, go and ask them. Um, and they came out and said, oh, well, we don't have any accounts here in, in, in the UK. Can, can, you, you'll have to pay. What? Uh, <laughs> so that was the bit where I kind of went, um, something's not quite right. So I ended up paying. Uh, How just much? Just to make it. Uh, off the top of my head, it was between three and five thousand pounds. Oh, yeah, just of a of a check. Wow! <laughs> to to make it happen. Lucky you um, had that money. I did. Yes, it was lucky, and I did get it all back. I, I was not out of pocket no. for the gig. I didn't make anything from it, but um, no, yeah. but nevertheless. So, no, and that was the bit where I kind of went, okay, things aren't quite. Where this they is are. not and a was, career. No, <laughs> no well, not <laughs> this with is them. A charitable organisation. <laughs> not with them, and I think it was it was a, a mixture of things um, with a lot of different things going on with Trent and who was running the shows and the productions and things. Um, I ended up, uh, at the end of that sort of two weeks of rehearsal, I was due to go to uh, Dublin, to fly to Dublin, Dublin to do the un, uh, MTV Awards with Underworld, uh, which I'd prearranged, so I wasn't sort of leaving the gig then. Um, that was a big job, wasn't it? The MTV Awards? Yeah. Yeah, no, that was that was huge um, because you basically, it's because it's a live TV production and you basically have to roll your whole set in in the, in the two and a half ad minute, minute ad break they give you oh. um, to get it all on and then you've got to mix it on, on time for your slot, so... Going from a, a live show where you control everything to being part of someone else's was, was a bit of a challenge. But Did you get paid lots and lots of money for doing that MP, MTV show? Um, not lots and lots, because it was just I was you know, it was just part of the crew. It was your daily rate, and no. it was just another gig, really. Big so you time, weren't getting though. anything from MTV. Big time. Yeah, no, very much so. Big time. Um, I mean, one of, the, one of the things I always appreciate about what Underworld did, and, and again, the, the, the transition from... You know, getting on the plane in in, uh, in London and arriving in Dublin was yeah, you know, it was heaven and hell really. Uh, and I actually made a call from Dublin and called up the production company who I was supplying the equipment and just said, um, I've, I've never done this, but I'm getting off the bus on this one, um, and uh, I'll stay on until you find someone. But it's just not for me. Um, and they respected that and they were really good. Uh, Des Fallon, who was the man I was working with then, just said, okay, yep, we'll sort it. Um, but it was very much, yeah, you kind of knew. I, I talked to a friend about it. And he said, uh, he said, you'll either, you'll either, um, you'll either, you'll, it'll, make, it'll make or break you. You'll either, people will be coming to you because they respect what your decision um, and you'll get lots of work or you'll never work again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was a bit of a roll of dice. Um, one of the things I kind of like in that production company, there was a bit of an expression at the time where, because lots of things were going wrong around that show, um, where instead of the old English slang of it's all gone a bit Pete Tong, um, for a week or two, it was all gone a bit Tim Kong, which I quite liked. <laughs> uh, next track, I don't know, took me by surprise, really, for a, a guy that's been working for the Lighthouse Family and the Chemical Brothers. And 
underworld, we have Elton John's Tiny Dancer. Mm-hmm. Where does that come from? Um, I think uh, in part, you know, talking about touring, I, I love the scene in Almost Famous uh, where the band right after the, the big fight and the big, you know, almost disaster. Did you like that movie? I Yeah, I enjoyed it. And I like um, the, the, the sentiments in it. It's yes. a little bit maudlin at times. Yeah. But I, I love the, um, the, the sense of what rock and roll was but the hints of what it was becoming in that movie uh, in terms of productions and, uh, you know, all the different, the corporatization of it, I suppose. Um, but I love the sense of that, the band and uh, being on the bus and the camaraderie. And I've had those moments where you're just sitting there enjoying it. And that's what I love about Underworld. They, all, they always treated the crew as part of the, part of the band in terms of, say, for example, at the MTV Awards, uh, there was a crew eating area and the band or the performers. Uh, and they just said to security, no, these guys are with us. You know, and we they eat with us, they make the show happen with us, so there's nothing separate about them. Um, and that sense of, um, you know, being looked after uh, was amazing and to be part of and to be part of something that created some really amazing things, beautiful things, um, I think is captured in this. Um, I, don't, I never sang it on a bus, but um, it brings back memories of <laughs> being on a bus. You can sing it in a radio too. New Zealand studio if you like. <laughs> and we have a certain Olympic theme running through this playing favourite session because not only did... Tim worked for Underworld, who did the soundtrack for the Danny Boyle opening ceremony in London. But Elton John has got one of five official songs played throughout the Olympics. He's teamed up with dance duo Panau. How do you say that, Tim? Panau. 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 Um, to record right. Good Morning to the Night. Panau. Panau. I didn't know this. So... It's, um, did you know that? I didn't, no. See, no. everybody's involved. There's there is no escape. Episode, pulled um, all the big names. Why did you stop <laughs> doing this video jock business? You were doing well. You were working with big names. You were having fun. You were still youngish. How old were you? Uh, I would have been 29, 29, 30, 28, 29, 30, somewhere around there. And you, <laughs> and you quit? I did, I did. Um... I think when I, when I when I left, if I go sort of, to sort of leaving from my career in New Zealand, I think one of the reasons I, I moved on from that, apart from just going on the OE, was I kind of looked at what I was doing and and, and I thought, I'm really enjoying it, I'm, I'm in a good position, I'm well respected and can do what I need to do, but I kind of just thought I'm going to be doing the same thing in five years, and I wanted to sort of stretch out and have a crack at something else. Did um, you have a home, a base? Were you always uh, in, moving around? In the UK or in... In, in the UK, yes. No, no, I did. Um, I was in Brighton for a year or two and then, and then living in London. Always had somewhere to come back to. Um, and, uh, but I think that the same thing, and I've sort of described it as, as one of the things in, in touring and that specialisation, which was great because it allows you a, a role, was that in some ways you're, you're only good inside that role and in some ways it's the relationships with bands that keep you going. Uh, and so um, you're almost living... You know, you're, you're reliant on that that band or that group to basically, you know, keep you employed in some ways. Um, and I, I've often sort of thought of it as you, 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 it's kind of like a sniper in the military. You're the best at your job, but you're useless outside um, that role. Um, and so, I, you know, I made the decision. The other the other part of it as well as I got engaged. Uh, and the year I was engaged, I was away for seven months um, from my partner Karen. And um, that she was, was long suffering then. She was. She was. Did you eventually marry said fiancé? I did, it's yes. Really good. Yep, in, in 2003. Is um, that another reason for settling down then? Yeah, and well, I think, you know, the, the rock and roll lifestyle is very much uh, a, uh, a single man's game, young man's game. Um, and I know people who are who are married and have kids who are, who are, in, are in it. Um, and I suppose it's sort of, you know, you've you've got to have a, a partner who, who supports that and understands that. Um, and... I made the decision to, to leave the road with, with no regrets. I don't look back at leaving it um, now with any regrets. Um, but, you know, you make choices to, to, to change. Um, and I've, I've loved that challenge, and there were some challenges, and not just in getting married, but also changing careers and retraining. Um, and uh, I think the thing that vindicated for me personally was a couple of years back when the Chemical Brothers were in, 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 in Auckland, and I went up to see them. And a couple of the guys who... who you know, same crew, most, mostly the same crew, uh, and oddly enough, looked almost exactly the same as when I'd left them uh, eight years ago. A couple of them came up just after the show and said, "You know, you did really well getting out, Kongi. You know, because you've, um, you know, you." And it's not just the grass is always greener, but to be able to get out from something that, as you say, does pay really well and has real camaraderie, um, 
but to be able to reinvent yourself and do something else and and be happy and satisfied is a is a challenging thing and and they they were able to see that and so in a way that helped me vindicate my decision did you decide <laughs> that you needed to get out and then think well what will i do what can i do or did you decide you wanted to be a teacher before you made the final cut um i think i'd always uh, if I were get you know right back to ninety four ninety five when I was finishing my degree, I'd, I'd considered teaching. This is a pol sci degree, yeah. Yes, yep, Bachelor of Arts in Political Science down at, at Canterbury. Mm. Um, I remember thinking I'd quite like to have a go at teaching. Um, the other thing I kind of looked at was maybe uh, foreign affairs, um, but I went to their presentation and they said you kind of need to be a lawyer, and I said well I don't really want to be a lawyer, <laughs> as well. Um, so I kind of moved away from that, and I, I like the idea of teaching, but I remember thinking to myself, I'm 21, 22, what can I teach anyone? Um, and wanting to go away and, and have some life really. Uh, so I felt sort of 10 years later that I had something to, to bring back into teaching and an appreciation of. Techno music. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and, and living, maybe? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, you obviously enjoy being part of a team. This is this seems to me what you got most out of in terms of working with Underworld, Chemical Brothers, less so, Nine Inch Nails, but <laughs> being on the road. The school obviously gives you that. It does, yeah. And I think... Um, you know, I've never been in the position of school leadership, but I think one of the challenges for principals is how do you put together a team uh, that covers all your, your bases um, and yet are, are powerful and connected teachers. I mean, you know, we all remember those unique teachers that have um, had an impact on us. Um, we probably don't as children or even as young people looking back or as older people looking back maybe know their nuances and their various parts that maybe may, maybe didn't make them the best team player. Um, so that's one of the challenges, I think, in terms of setting up schools and, and what education is. Um, that very often those, you know, how to, how to marry all those different talents and those different needs uh, and, and look after them um, is a huge challenge. Are you happy with the way teaching is going? This is a loaded question, of course, because <laughs> I've read some of your blogs. Oh, yes, yes. And I suppose... I wondered when I was reading this if you ever got any flack for it because it's fairly outspoken in terms of government policy. You don't like the idea of national standards very much and so on. Does anybody say, shut up now? Uh, not to my face. They might be reading it now. <laughs> I might get a few more. Um, I don't think, I mean, you know, if we go to the national standards, and I, and I think I say that on my blog pretty clearly that these are my opinions, they're not my schools, they're not the ministries. Um, I guess, you know, national standards as a... As a, as a concept, uh, are really a, a measuring tool. It's a data gathering exercise, and I think there's some validity to that. You know, it helps us to manage public accountability and a taxpayer spend. Um, and I guess of themselves, they're just a tool. Where I think they break down is when they become the thing that we're doing. I guess you know, in a in an odd way, I have to legally teach the New Zealand curriculum, um, but I have to legally report against the national standards. Uh, and the two when they came out didn't match and so that was a real challenge for schools to say well you know we have to teach this thing but we have to report against this thing and um, it's been a struggle really I think to make that happen I think some schools are doing it better than others um, I don't think it's made any poor schools however you define that any better I don't think it's made any bad uh, good schools worse um, in that sort of whole idea of improving educational outcomes um, but I guess the exercise, and, and the Prime Minister said it earlier, it is, you know, it's ropey data, uh, in part because they never set a standard for sending that data in. You know, all two and a half thousand, well, less than that, but all, all primary schools could basically write their own, you know, documents to send in. Um, so it was always going to be ropey data. <laughs> uh, and it is, I guess I kind of wonder, what's, what's the end game for them? You know, uh, yes, we can measure schools. Um, and we can measure schools in different ways. We do that already with decile ratings and, and you know what they look like and feel like. Um, but I think for you know parents who have students, uh, the best school is going to be the one that their student feels comfortable in. Um, whether that shows up in national standards data is, is neither here nor there, really. Mm. Um, I don't know whether you've formulated it. I don't know whether you've blogged about it. I haven't seen about the charter school concept. 
I haven't. No, I haven't. I haven't really written too much about it. I wrote a little bit uh, late last year about the Teach for New Zealand program, which was one of their other solutions uh, to the problem. Um, I guess you know, like standards and, and charter schools and performance pay and, and the Teach for NZ program. I, you, a lot of them seem to be a solution to a problem that I don't think we've really defined yet. Um, you know, the talking point out of this government seems to be <clears throat> one in five are failing, one in five are failing, we must do things. And so they're doing things. And, and I guess in the back of my head I go, well, doesn't that mean four and five are succeeding to some degree uh, in a public education system? Yeah, but we're not happy with that, and rightly so. Why, why should we be happy with, with a 20% failure rate? No, I'm not saying we are happy. But I think that, you know, say national standards, for example, we already know who those one in five are. So national standards just remeasure that. Um, I think charter schools, <clears throat> you know, I, I come back, my first three years were at Avalon Intermediate, uh, a decile two school, um, with, you know, a huge amount of, of, of issues beyond the school grounds that would have an impact on what you could do with those children. What's your current school, C2 school, decile rating? C2 school's decile 10. Right. Yeah. So a big difference between those two schools. Differences in the communities and societies that are around them. And in I the guess, quality of teaching? Um, this is probably... In individual teachers or in what the outcomes uh, I don't know. You decide which is most important. <laughs> um, well, I think, you know, s schools reflect their communities uh, in, s in terms of the students that come from those communities. Um, individual schools are doing the best that they can with the teachers that they have and with the resources that they have to make a difference in, in their children and their students. Um, yeah, on, on sheer face value, you might say, well, Seton, of course, being a SL10 is going to be better than Avalon Intermediate. Um, but in terms of the impact that a teacher inside Avalon Intermediate might have on however many students, you know, how do I measure that? Yeah. Um, I've got one student who I know from Avalon who, who, when she left in year eight, her goal was to graduate from university, the first of her, her family to do that. And I've stayed in touch with her mother and I've said, if, when, when she does that, let me know, you know. And that is just a small measure of me and my impact on her. Um, I think the constant challenge coming from 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 rock and roll where you had that feedback loop every day when you stood on a stage and you knew whether it was a good or a bad show. That's probably the great challenge with teaching. You never... Don't they boo you? <laughs> oh, occasionally they do. Occasionally they do. We've had the run off stages as they throw things at you. I was um, thinking of the kids. Oh, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes. Yeah, the complaint from teachers is an increasing amount of paperwork, which is not teaching, but the recording of outcomes, if you like. Mm -hmm. Can you give me an idea of, of how much paperwork... Yeah, is it a problem for you? Um, I think, I mean, a lot of this, you know, paperwork is basically based on compliance. And so we have to say we're doing what we're doing. Um, and I think individual schools, I mean, all schools have to provide X amount of paperwork to the ministry in all the different forms. Um, and like I said, I'm not a, 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 a school principal, but you see some of the paperwork they have to deal with, and it's pretty insane. Um but I think the challenges in, in what are, and, and one of the things that sort of comes in with technology is that we're kind of saying, well, you know, we've got databases and we can collect all this data in, in different ways. Um, the challenge is we, we need to have discussions about what is, the, A, firstly, the point of collecting it, and if it's the point to send it to someone at the ministry, then that's the point. Um, but what, you know, if it's to inform our teaching, then there's a point there. Uh, I mean, teachers on a daily basis are scribbling notes on bits of paper or in planners, um, there's this constant scale between the things you need to collect to make your, your next lesson useful or powerful, to report to your team, to report to the board. Uh, and there's different layers of how you have to organize that. So that becomes, I think, if I'm really honest, um, the individual or a collective responsibility within that school to say what are the important things that we need. And that will be different at different levels uh, and paying attention to that. And actually, it's sometimes going, you know what, do we need to collect that? If we don't, we shouldn't. Um, I think sometimes with technology, uh, we get conf we confuse ourselves by saying, well, we could put it in a spreadsheet, or we could put it in a database, or we could put it in somewhere online, and so you end up, you know, collecting the same data in five different ways. Yeah. And then you're all you're doing is just making it harder for yourself. Do you aspire to be a principal? Ah, aspire is a big word. Um, I don't know if I do yet. If I'm really honest, I think um, principals well, have Well, by its powerful... very nature, aspiration isn't yet. Mm. So. You know, 20 years down the track, you'd like to be a principal? Um, 
I've always said to myself that I want to be in the place where you can make the most change um, and, and hopefully positive change. Um, I think school principals have a very powerful role to play within their local, their local school and their local community. Um, I think um, one of the challenges for us going forward is, you know, with tomorrow's schools, the, the, comp the aim of tomorrow's schools is to be every school to be the best it can be. Um, and so by, by that very nature, you exclude maybe working with other schools um, to some degree um, because you want your place to be the best. Um, and, yeah, I don't know if where I want to be as, a, as, a, as an individual is, is best going to be served in, in being a principal. Mm. Um, that Time will tell. Yeah. It <laughs> makes no difference is not my commentary on what you've just said, but <laughs> the next choice, uh, the band's yeah. track, It Makes No Difference from... Northern Lights, Southern Cross, 1975. Just mm -hmm. quickly talk me into this, and we will run it up to the news. Um, this is, uh, I, I know this from the, the album The Last Waltz, which was sort of the band's big finale, yeah. um, given it by a, a, a friend of mine uh, called Jay Roberts, who was down here working on some movies, a, a true scholar and a gentleman, uh, and who uh, introduced me to it. I just love Best it. music video. Yes. Best music film, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, no, very, you know, Scorsese is brilliant in it. Yeah. I, I love, I think as I've gotten older, moving away from what I used to do, I love listening to stories and songs and I think there's some really powerful story in this which is why I chose it very nice to talk to you and let us remember the late great Lee Von Helm for whom Elton John and Bernie Taupin whom we listened to earlier on wrote Lee Von everything joins up all connects